I, I want to start here today because we come to the, the beatitude that is probably the most difficult. It is very important for us to understand the essence of Christianity. The essence of Christianity is this. We, oh, let me start here. Jesus expended his life for you. He calls us to expend our life for others. The essence of Christianity is this. Sacrifice. Sacrifice. There is nothing easy about spiritual growth, and there is nothing easy about building a church. It is all built through sacrifice. And here's where it all began, right here. So Jesus was not a spiritual leader that came and killed people. Jesus was a spiritual leader that came and gave himself for people. And that's what Christianity is. You don't ever come to church for what you get. If you come to church hoping for, with any expectations, you will go away disappointed with church. Never come to church with any expectations of what you might get. You only ever come to church with the opportunity to give. The church is not about what we get. The church is about what we give. And that's not just our money. That's our life. That's Christianity. The expenditure of my life for the benefit of someone else is what Christianity is all about. One of the biggest problems that has entered into the church It's called consumerism. Consumerism is deadly in a church. You don't come here to consume. You come here to contribute. And some of you can contribute financially. Some of you can't do a whole lot. I often think the story that God put in the Bible, if you put a penny, you contribute. But some of you contribute time. Some of you contribute talents and abilities. But a church is not what I go to get something. A church is where I go to give something. Like the little kid. Remember the story years ago of the little kid that came to church and when he came in and the offering plate came by, he was all alone and he didn't have anything. So he just said to the usher, put it down a little lower. And so the usher did a little lower and finally put the offering plate on the floor and then the little boy stepped into it. That's Christianity. That's Christianity. We give ourself. And through the expenditure of ourself, God uses that to impact the lives of other people. It starts right there. It starts right there. And I like that image just to burn deep into your heart because that's Christianity. That's our Savior right there. Matthew said it this way. Jesus was speaking. He said this. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. So you want to be a part of a church? (laughs) You want to be a Christ follower? You want to be a disciple? Starts there. Deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow. 
I can only tell you this from my perspective, and my testimony would be this. Saved as a five-year-old boy, called to serve in my years of college, fought it with everything I had, but if I had to do it over again, it's been worth it all. Serving Christ is worth it all. And it is the expenditure of our lives for the benefit of the other person. That's the essence of Christianity. It's not what I can get out of it. It's what I give to it. And if we get that backwards, then we get it all out of sorts. We're out of sorts completely. A church is not a consumer-oriented entity. It is a commitment-oriented. We serve for the benefit of others. Jesus said this, whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever will lose their life for me will find it. And those are powerful words that when you give up, what, what did the old missionary say? What I gained, I lost. What I have, I lost. It's Corey Ten Boom. But what I gave, I have. And that's what Jesus said. You want to find your life? Lose it. That's a weird message, isn't it? It's a weird message. Well, let's go further. Jesus, Paul said it this way. Paul interpreted it and, and wrote this. I have been crucified with Christ. What does that mean? What are the implications of that statement? When Paul makes the statement, I have been crucified with Christ. In other words, he's saying this, I died. I died. The I died. Then he went on and he said it this way, but Christ lives in me. I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. That word in is a literal, interesting word. In, 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 the, in the Greek language, it, it can be translated in or through, and it, it literally would read like this. I no longer live, but Christ lives through me. That's how, that's how Christ manifests his presence in the world today, through you. Think about that. So he said this, the life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Powerful statement right there. Paul picked that up and wrote that verse. So the Sermon on the Mount is this. It is uh, Jesus teaching what a new covenant person's life will look like. And then he goes on, and these are God's expectations for a New, co new Testament or a New Covenant believer. So let's look at this one today, verses 10 to 12. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, just to give you a little information, the Beatitudes are a sandwich, if you would. It begins, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It ends with, blessed are the persecuted, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. There's a sandwich there, and there's a bunch in between. But what you get is the kingdom. It's yours. And we want to look at that today, but what he does, he ties two additional verses to this uh, passage. He gives... Uh, two, uh, verses 11 and 12 are, are supplementary information that goes along with it, and we'll get into that as we get into this today. Now let's just look at this. What does it mean to be persecuted? Well, it's an interesting word. Uh, we would say dioko is the word. It means this, to pursue. It's, it's a literal translation of the word is to pursue. Okay. In other words, somebody is pursuing you for the purpose of trying to follow after you to run you down it means persecution but the literal the word itself means there is someone pursuing you well, that wants to do uh, what is not good to your life so jesus said blessed are those who are persecuted what does it mean to be persecuted i want to give you four statements today okay four applications to this truth and i hope they'll 
just speak to your heart. This is hard to speak on for me for this reason. We aren't the persecuted church. But our brothers and sisters around the world are persecuted, are being persecuted today. We are living in the time when more Christians are dying than any other time in history. There is more persecution today in the church than at any time in church history. Most of it is taking place in Muslim countries. Okay? Sudan, Africa, uh, hundreds if not thousands of Christians are losing their lives in some of those African countries. I read in, uh, was it Sudan? In recent days, as many as 80 churches have been burned completely through the ground. Persecution is ongoing today. It's very difficult for us to come into a building like this and begin even to understand this concept. How do we speak on it? And how do we even give it justice? When around the world, our brothers and sisters are being put to death for their faith. We can't do it justice, guys. We can't. We can't comprehend what much of Christianity today is living under. So to some degree today, on a scale of 1 to 10, with 10 being deep, we've got to speak on the level of 1, because none of us have shed any blood for Christianity. And let's just keep that in mind as we go through this passage of Scripture. We don't understand what it means to put our life on the line for Christ. Imagine yourself, if you can, sitting in some edifice today in Iran. We can't even do it, can we? We can't. So I'm standing before you today at a total loss, saying in so many ways that I'm not worthy to say what this message says today. If we could bring our brothers and sisters from Africa or Egypt or some of those countries today, and they stood before us, I'm not sure how we'd respond other than, wow. I read the account this week of a lady whose husband was just recently beheaded by the religious sect that believes if you're not their sect, you kill, you, you die. And her testimony was, I'm so grateful that my husband was faithful to Christ to the very end. So imagine yourself being that wife today sitting in, your church, in this church, and your husband this week was beheaded for his Christianity. Can you even imagine it? We can't. We can't. So we cannot do justice today to our text. So a disclaimer going into it, but we're going to try and deal with it. Application, first of all, is this. Those who live the Beatitudes will experience some form of persecution. We do. We are in our country more and more. Franklin Graham, was it long ago? How long ago did Franklin Graham make the statement? Be prepared in America for persecution. It is coming. It is, it is on the horizon. It is coming. For many of us here today, for like myself, as I sit and, and, and look at this, I think at, at the age I am now, uh, I, I get that. When I look at my grandson who is three months old, I pray. His world will be completely different than my world was. And so how do I, as a grandparent, pour into his life in such a way that will help prepare him for what he may face someday? Let me give you a couple statements under this. Biblical Christianity is countercultural. It was in Jesus' day. Imagine when Jesus gave this message. Imagine the Pharisees standing there next to him when he said, Blessed are 
those who are persecuted for yours is the kingdom of heaven. Most of the people he was looking at were the ones doing the persecution. See, uh, Saul, who became Paul, was responsible for the death of Stephen. Remember? Christ himself was going to be persecuted at the ultimate of persecution. He was going to be put to death. The time that Jesus lived was a time of great persecution, and Christianity was persecuted. And Jesus said, blessed are those who are persecuted, not those who are persecuting. And, and, and so Christianity is countercultural. There was a time when America was, was founded. America was founded on principles of liberty. Principles of liberty are very interesting, but they basically are principles that are found in God's word. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. And as truth was put out there, what's happening is as our nation goes farther and farther away from God, there's becoming restrictions on certain things, and you see it. An example, gun control is just one of the examples. They want to, you know, they want to take them away. And, and it's not going to solve the problem. You know that, but they're convinced that they have to do that. And it is the gradual removal of freedoms. And, and now what's happening is lifestyles are being promoted, and if you oppose lifestyles, you're seen as someone who is persecuting. And so they're going to move, and Canada has done some of this in the, in the hate speech crimes and some of this stuff, where if you just share what the Bible says... You're going to, it's going to be considered hate speech. That day is not coming. That day is here. It's here. We're living in it. And our kids and our grandkids are going to feel the implications of that. You have to understand, every aspect of Christianity is counter-cultural. It goes against the grain of where cultures go. And, and you, you have a whole generation of, of this. The reason everybody in the younger generation wants socialism, not everybody, that's an overstatement. The reason socialism is becoming so popular in, in the day and the younger people want it, because they get everything they want without having to work to get it. I saw one of the politicians the other day promised Black housing, $100 billion, so black people can have houses. Well, first of all, that's racism. Okay? That's racism. She should say this. Everybody gets a free house. That's not racism. That's discrimi discrimination is when one set gets something and the rest don't. But they're beginning to say, we're going to give you this. We're going to wipe out all your college debts. We're going, to, we're going to do all this for you. And what's happening is you've got a consumer mentality that's just consuming, consuming, and consuming. And that mentality is what's coming into the church. And so the church says it isn't about consumption. It's about contribution. So the very essence of Christianity is countercultural. And, and, and you're beginning to see it more and more in the day in which we live. It's not bad. John Kennedy, remember, some of you remember, I remember as a two-year-old boy. No, I wasn't two. So, no. Remember as a young kid when John Kennedy stood up and gave his famous speech in 1960, it was. I was a six-year-old boy, so I remember it. Ask not what your country can do for you but ask what you can do for your country. That was the Democratic Party of that day. My how times have changed. Because the, the, the message today is, ask what your country can do for you. And, that's, and so what's happening is we're getting this Christianity that says, what can Christianity do for me? I'm going to tell you, Christianity is countercultural. It's not what Christianity can do for you, but what can you do for your church? Now, Christianity will take care of your eternity and forgive you of your sins. I get that. But I want you to understand that biblical Christianity is countercultural. And what biblical Christianity, the second statement is this 
Biblical Christianity exposes sinful behavior, and that's what the world hates. Right there. Right there. So every, those who will live the Beatitudes will experience some form of persecution. You will be ridiculed. You will be, the, the worst we get in America is we get ridiculed for our faith. You really don't believe that stuff, do you? I really do. Second statement I'll give you. Not everyone will experience the same level of persecution. Okay? Not everyone will. And, and you know, I, I am still so thankful to be an American because we really haven't experienced what people around the world are experiencing today. And, and it was only the grace of God that for all of us we were born in this country, a country which everybody wants to get into, right? And you understand why they want to get into it? They're fleeing. Most of those people are fleeing stuff that if we had the opportunity, we would flee too. So we're fortunate to have been born here. We're fortunate to be citizens for most of us. And we should understand why all the people of the world want to get here and become citizens of this great country. The only thing we say to it, just do it legally. That's all. You're all welcome. Come on in. Go through the right processes. Don't make it a political issue where it's just about votes. Now, for most of us, we're going to experience some level of persecution, but most of us haven't shed any blood for Christianity yet. So I'll say it this way, and I want to take it down this. I want you to think this, this concept through, because I think this is very, very important for us to understand. The more the persecution, the more focused is the church. Okay? Okay? And the other statement I make to you is this. The less the persecution, the more the church loses focus. If you miss everything else I say today, get that. Okay? Get that. The easier the church has it, the easier it loses its focus. Let me, let me, let me walk you through this. I'd like to say in the church there's about three levels of things. I call it our ACPs, okay? There are things that for us are absolutes, there are things for us that are convictions, and there are things for us that are preferences, okay? The absolute would be this. We believe the Bible is the Word of God. That is an absolute. Baptism is a conviction. We believe baptism should take place after salvation, and it's by placing you in the water. It's a picture of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. That's a conviction of this, this church. Okay? The music style is a, is a preference. Okay? Uh, and you may or may not like it, but music is a preference. Okay? When a church is under persecution, preferences are almost forgotten. Because the individual's Personal preferences are like when our brothers and sisters sitting around us may not be here next week because they were beheaded for the faith, you don't argue over music. What are you willing to die for? The absolutes. Okay? Even the convictions, but not the preferences. What happens when a church doesn't have persecution Preferences get rated high, convictions, and then absolutes kind of get, oh, they're important, but. When it comes to a church being persecuted, absolutes are everything. Because what you have to ask when persecution is taking place is this, what are we willing to die for? And so I just make this observation for you to ponder. Because some, sometimes you might come in a church and say, I don't like it. I don't like the way we do things. I don't like this or I don't like that. If our brothers and sisters sitting next to us are dying around us because they're being persecuted, the I takes the back seat to the we. Do you understand that? 
and, and when there is no persecution, what happens is the eye sort of pops out there and it's like, well, I don't like this or I don't like that. I don't like it done this way or I don't like it done that way. Now, I'm not trying to make this up and I'm not trying to be critical, but can you see that? Can you see that in churches? That the less the persecution, the more the church loses focus. The more the persecution, the more focused is the church. All right? That's what we have to guard against. Really, it's this. What are my pre- Who cares what my preferences are? They are meaningless in the scope of eternity. Meaningless. They are nothing more than personal preferences. When I come into church, I don't come in saying, well, this is what I want, and this is what I want, and this is what I want. If we come to church for what we want, or what we like, or what we don't like, then I will tell you this. The less the persecution, the more the church loses focus as a church. You see it? The American church as a whole has lost focus. Okay. I I mean, take it back a couple years. We went through this whole period in the American church where it was about the felt needs of people. So when people come in, we need to meet those felt needs. Well, first of all, nobody knows what their felt needs were. Secondly, the church isn't about you or me. We should come to church saying, God is the one who should receive all the credit, all the glory, all the honor, not us. So the church should not focus on who we are, it should focus on who God is, because when I understand who God is, I'm able to get in the proper alignment with who God is. And when you bring it down to who I am and make it about me, I, focus is lost right there. It's lost. Man, I hate the alarm clock. So, I, I hope you get that. I like what Francis Chan said the other day. Someone went out of church and said, I I don't like the way they do things. And Francis Chan says, it wasn't about you. It's about God. It's about God. The thing we should all say going out was God honored with my worship today. Not my wife's worship next to me. Not the person next to me. Was God honored by my worship today. And I'm convinced of this. If I, as a church, I should feel good about God, I may or may not feel good about myself. But I do find when I understand salvation and I understand God, when I'm in right relationship with God, I can feel good about myself because I have a Savior who rescues The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Tertullian, way back in history. Think about that. According to statisticians, you know where the church is growing the fastest today? Iran. That's unbelievable. Iran. But if you convert to Christianity, odds are high you die. Because the Islam that rules believes that if you leave Islam, you're to be killed. Okay. Tertullian said this, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. When we have something that we're willing to die for, then the world will have something that they want. When our Christianity is, uh, we can kind of toy with it. It's not what they want. Entertainment can provide that. What Christianity provides is something worth dying for because the cause is bigger than the individual. Because Christ is greater than us. And when we're willing 
to give ourselves for it. Jesus says, you get the kingdom. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of me. That's a powerful statement. That statement of Tertullian is true. But it's also true here. Grace Bible Church will only go forward on the sacrifices of God's people. There's no other way. It takes all of us willing to give all for the church to go forward. Churches are only built through the sacrifice of God's people. Blessed are those who are persecuted. Yours is the kingdom. Now, third emphasis, and I'll just give you this and we'll run. We won't. The emphasis is on being persecuted for Jesus and righteousness. Okay? That's the emphasis of this text. It's stated two times in here. It either says because of righteousness or because of me. I think verse 11 says because of me. I just, so the persecution that we get should not be because of our stupidity or our whatever. It should only be because of standing for right and, and for Jesus. Last thing, and we'll quit with this, is, is this. We must develop the proper mindset. That is a principle that I want to give you. And I want to deal with the next two verses that are in here, okay? We are blessed, verse 11 says, uh, blessed are those, it expands on it. We are blessed because we partner with Jesus in sacrifice. That's how Christianity goes forward, and that's how churches go forward. We're blessed because the pattern that Jesus set for us is the pattern that we are to follow. Okay? So we get the partner, read, read verse 11. And the second point is in verse 12. It says this, we should rejoice because our sacrifices advance our Christianity. So the hard times you're going through, your Christianity is contagious when you're going through hard times. Very contagious. And trust me, others are watching you. Okay? So Jesus expands on this with, those, with verse 11 and verse 12. And says, your attitude should be one of, it is a blessing. And then, we should rejoice. Not that we're persecuted, but that Christianity is advanced through our sacrifices. That's where we rejoice. Now, if, if we got this right, the Bible should back us up. So let me give you some verses. Okay, let's start with Romans 8. Okay, it says this. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. That's Christianity right there. Christianity is not health, wealth, and prosperity. That is a false gospel from start to finish. If you come into Christianity and expect to get wealthy, healthy, and whatever, you've got, that is not Christianity. This is the Christianity that Paul taught right here. Now, God will supply your needs, that's a for sure. He promised that, right? But here's Christianity. If indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. Okay, let's go to 2 Corinthians. Let's look at what Paul says in 2 Corinthians. To the Corinthian church, he said this, For just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so also our comfort abounds through Christ. Okay? Same, see the concept that Jesus taught? Blessed are persecuted now being carried out through the rest of Scripture. Let's go to Philippians. When Paul writes to the Philippians, he said this, Even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. In other words, when my life is poured out for your benefit, that's where I find my source of joy. So I would ask you this. The pouring out of your life is helping who? 
Growth comes at expense. The growth of another person. You know, kids, kids growing up take a tremendous toll on parents. Okay? Parents have to pour in, pour in, pour in, pour in. Parenting is not getting back, getting back, getting back. Parenting is giving out, giving out, giving out, giving out, giving out, giving out, giving out. When does it giving out? It doesn't. Just so you know, my kid's 40 now and it's still giving out. It never ends. But I don't want it to end. Ever. My grandkids, them little thinkers. They can get money out of us quicker than anybody else in the whole world. Hey, Grandpa. Hey, Pappy, would you give me that? Sure, I'll get you three or four of them. How many more do you want? He's like, geez, it never ends. And then one lady stops me on the street and says, is that your first grandkid? How'd you know? She said, oh, I could tell. And she looks at me and she goes, you think grandkids are great? Way to get great grandkids. And I, was, I just wanted to hit her. I'm like, lady, I'm, I'm not in a hurry to get there. But what she's saying is, great-grandkids, the legacy continues, the legacy continues. And not only do we want our physical legacy, but far more than our physical legacy, we want our spiritual legacy to live on. Someday we get to heaven and meet all the people that are there because you poured out your life for them. It will be worth it. You only wish you'd have given more. You only wish you'd have given more. Well, it doesn't stop there. Let me give you this one verse and quit. I think this is the most powerful of all. Paul said to the Colossians, he said this, Now I rejoice in what I am suffering for you. That's a powerful statement in it. And I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. In other words, Christ began a concept that continues to this day. He gave himself for us. We give ourselves for others. That's Christianity. The expenditure of self for the benefit of someone else. My life is to be poured out so that you can experience life. That's where you will find your greatest joy. Because when you lose your life, you gain it. So the four principles reiterated blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness for theirs is the kingdom let me show you a video and kind of drive the point home for you <laughs> 